So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I want to first thank uh, Charlotte, everyone from TEDx, for inviting me here. It's a huge honor to be here and very glad that I can come talk to you guys today. And in the course of this talk, I, uh, I do want to take you guys into the future, talk a little bit about what the future of data might look like. Uh, but in order to do that, I think first we need to look a little bit into the past. So I want to take us back to the dark ages of humanity, back to the year 2000, when renting a movie was like this. You didn't know it was good or bad. You had no idea if you were going to like it or not. It was a horrible, depressing time for humanity. But thankfully, now we live in 2011, where the click of a button, I can see a world of customized movies. I know what's good or bad, and I can make better decisions about how I want to spend my Saturday night. So what changed? Data. We started collecting more information than we ever had before about what people liked and what they didn't, and that allowed us to make better decisions. And what I really want to talk to you guys about is the people behind these changes, the data scientists. Uh, you can call these guys statisticians, data analysts. A lot of the people in this room probably fall into this category. But whatever you call them, these are the people that work with data to build tools so that the world can make better decisions. Now, I'm a data scientist in my day trade. And what I'll tell you about data scientists is that we work on data 24 hours a day, not just in our day jobs. So we're tweeting about things we're working on, writing blog posts about our data projects. Uh, a lot of people have probably been to a hackathon. Uh, for the uninitiated, that's when you get data people and developers together for 24 hours, and you just see what cool stuff they can come up with. And I remember when I moved back to New York, I was so excited to go to my first hackathon because I'm sitting in this room with all these people who have the most amazing machine learning skills humanity's ever seen, the, the sharpest coding skills. I couldn't wait to see what we were going to come up with. You know, it was going to be so incredible. It was going to be so amazing. It was going to be so world changing. And what we came up with was so unfulfilling. Well, here's, a, here's an app that helps you park your car. Here's something that shows you local deals. Now, these are great applications. I use these apps all the time. But they're applications that make very comfortable lives ever so slightly more comfortable. And it just seems that if we're using the most advanced machine learning skills and data analysis skills that humanity has ever seen, we owe it to ourselves to do more than just make sure that never again does Netflix recommend 500 days of summer when it really should have recommended the notebook. Now, before we start talking about throwing around terms like hacking poverty and things like that, remember there are social organizations out there, and they are awash in data. So this is a group that brings clean water to people in Africa, and they have data about surveys that they conduct. They have data about well locations. They have data about their finances. And more than just the data that they're collecting, there are data from third parties as well. So data from governments. The World Bank is opening up its data. So there's all this data that they could, they could use to help maximize their impact, but no one's looking at it. And understandably, no one's looking at it. These guys don't have the budget for a data scientist. They're not Google. And so all this great potential just gets lost. So on the one hand, we have a group of people who are very good at looking at data, but not, don't have a lot of social outputs for it. And on the other, we have social organizations who have lots of data, but no one to look at it. So I hope you're asking the same question that we were, which is, can we get these two together? And that is exactly what Data Without Borders is designed to do connect expert data scientists with visionary social organizations on everything from year-long fellowships to uh, short-term projects to even just a weekend together. And the goal of this project, the goal of this initiative, is to look at the entire data pipeline. So not just coming in and doing analysis for social organizations, but looking at everything from are your surveys statistically valid? How are you managing your data? Are there third-party uh, open data sources that you could be using? And so by bridging these two communities, you give data scientists a chance to have social impact. You give social organizations a chance to maximize their impact. And in the process, we all get to live in a better world. So I'll give you a few examples and show why it's so important to think about data this way in the social sector. The New York Civil Liberties Union was interested in understanding if the NYPD was using racial discrimination. It's a great question. And it turns out there's great data behind it, too. Because every time the NYPD stops and frisks someone, they collect a huge amount of data about it, where it happened, when it happened, what other force was involved. So we're in a really great position here because we have a lot of great data, and we have a great question, so let's answer it. So here's the data. So who can tell me if the NYPD is using racial discrimination? Yeah, no, me neither. And if you're a social organization, this is probably where you stop. If you don't have those data skills, you probably may not have even gotten to this point. So we worked with the NYCLU, and this is what we came up with, one of the things we built, which is a map of all the stop and frisks that occurred in 2010. And what's immediately apparent from this is you begin to see things. You can start to see these hot spots in Spanish Harlem, these hot spots in Brooklyn. And I guarantee you would not have seen that in this block of data. So by giving a lens into the data, you give NYCLU the power to start to answer this very thorny question. And what's so important about tools like this is that they don't just answer questions, they allow you to ask questions too. 
Because I guarantee as you're using this, you're going to see things you hadn't thought of before. Oh, uh, why is it when I'm looking at this, why does the map sort of light up at the end of the month? Does NYPD have a quota? Well, that would be a pretty big civil rights violation. So tools like this allow you to not just answer questions, but ask them as well, and helps these organizations fulfill their mission. The United Nations Global Pulse, fantastic group that collects data from all around the world to understand the state of the world. They recently did a well-being study. They wanted to know how happy people were, and they allowed people to respond by cell phone about various conditions of their happiness. Now, before they could even start to address the results of looking at how happy people were across the world, they wanted to know who's even responding to us. We don't even have a good sense of where this information's coming from. And they came with data that looks similarly opaque. You can't necessarily tell from this. But put into a tool like this, you immediately begin to see where and when people are reacting to things, where these survey responses are coming, and how that's changing over time. And this tool, built by one of our volunteers, Paul Butler, was so important that this was actually used in a presentation to the United Nations General Assembly about using data for development. So tools like this, tools that allow you to look into data and to understand data better, are already starting to shape the conversation about how the international community thinks about data and thinks about doing things in the future. Now, lest you think this is all about just making maps, uh, there are a huge breadth of needs that social organizations have. People like the Grameen Foundation. These guys have a community knowledge worker program in Africa, and they were curious to see, how is the program running? How are our knowledge workers doing? And their spreadsheets of data that they started with gave way to analyses on seasonal changes, how people were acting over time, over the year, gave information about how different districts were performing, or even a tool that allowed them to rank the differences in how these groups were doing. And if all of these little tools are sort of windows into that data that allow people, again, to sort of answer questions, but also ask questions, just to understand what they're doing in their core mission. Now, if you're sitting in the audience, you're thinking, I could do that. You're right. Every tool that I've shown up here was built by volunteer in under 24 hours. And it goes to show that these sorts of skills, mapping things, making graphs, things that are bread and butter for data scientists or developers, are fairly straightforward for us, but can be transformative for social organizations because they show things that you never would have seen before, and they allow you to answer, ask questions, and create more of an impact. So I'll leave you with a thought. If these are the sorts of things that can happen when data people get together with social organizations, if this is what happens when they think together, what kinds of questions could we answer together? You know, if you're someone out there who's a developer or a data scientist, you know, what if you didn't spend your free time creating the next restaurant review app, and what if you were actually feeding people? And if you're a social organization, if you had access to data skills, what kind of questions could you answer? And what if we could live in a world where we didn't just use data to make better decisions about what kind of movies we wanted to see, but what if we really lived in a world where we used data to make better decisions about what kind of a globe we wanted to see? So thank you very much. <laughs>